Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're happy you're with us. We'll talk to artist Robert Dowd, who was born and raised in Michigan. He went to the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit, and while there, in 1959, painted his first pop image. It was a stop sign. Robert Dowd has a strong presence in the pop school of the 60s, and we're really happy he's with us today. What is pop art, Robert? What is pop art? <laughs> From the artist's standpoint, it's uh, dealing with images in a pretty point-blank way. Um, personally, at that period, in, in, when I was working with that kind of imagery, uh, I like to look at objects uh, kind of like down the muzzle of objects. It wasn't pop art then. It wasn't pop no. art. Well, who was influencing your painting at that time? Well, I had just recently uh, left school uh, a couple of years before. And during that period, while I was studying uh, the old masters, Vermeer, uh, I was taken by Jasper Johns, some of his bullseye and American flag paintings. But that, not a direct influence, but he certainly opened the door. But the, but the masters had really nothing to do with that, did they? Or, or was that an extension of, of your painterliness or? Well, I think when the, it's a matter of, of investigating all different areas, uh, being involved in looking at one particular old master for the way they may have approached space, another mm. for the way they handled paint. Uh, and many of them worked in a very contemporary manner. When you talk about pushing and looking down the barrel at different things, what were the objects um, that you were painting at that time? What were you looking at? Well, prior to the stop signs, uh, which were kind of out of context, while I was in school, I was working in a lot of different ways, searching for uh, metaphor. Uh, it was when I went to San Francisco in 1960 that I actually began thinking about common objects as subject matter. Common objects, yeah. I think that's yeah. the clue, isn't it, to pop art? Yeah, it is. Or, I it's mean, is really, that yeah, I did later on called pop popular culture, but basically taking objects that weren't probably the kind of objects that people would think of painting. And, and what were and, those objects? Well, for me, they were postage stamps and currency. And um, we, we have a postage stamp. Uh, yes, which the is 60s. From, from the 60s. Right. Um, were other people, I think other people at that time, on the East Coast were painting common objects? Who, who well, were those Well, what happened people? was uh, Walter Hopps at the Pasadena Museum, he was a young curator, saw the work and said he had seen similar kinds of work in New York by two or three people. And he was taken with the fact that here were uh, a half a dozen artists in the United States working independently without any knowledge of each other in this particular vein. But you didn't know what they were painting in no. the East then. No. Only he was the only catalyst, so, or, was, or people, dealers coming back and forth, or curators. Well, not even that. It wasn't even at that level. It was that uh, Walter was able to visit studios. Uh, it happened to turn out to be Warhol and Lichtenstein and Jim Dine, but n no one was showing at that time. No one had a gallery. They weren't represented. And the first show was put together by Walter at the Pasadena Museum in 62. That was the objects. Of, uh, new, what was it called? Common objects? New paintings of common objects. Yeah, and right. you were in it. Yeah. There were a lot of uh, West Coast people, Joe Good. Ed Roche, Ed Roche. Uh, Wayne Thibault, uh, Jim Dine. And from the East Coast? It was Jim Dine, uh, Andy oh, Warhol. Oh, Jim was living. Oh, that's right. He was living and there. Roy Lichtenstein. <coughs> And that was it. And that was the show at the right. old Pasadena. The old Pasadena. Museum. Right. Then was that um, 
at the time, were you painting under the name O'Dowd, or was that part of the pop culture? Did you change your name to O'Dowd, or was it really O'Dowd? No, what O'Dowd? happened is, it, no, it started, <coughs> uh, I started painting as Dowd, and what happened for a short period here in Los Angeles is another artist appeared on the scene with the name Dowd. Oh, that's what it was. And since <coughs> many things that are written about artists only use the last name, I thought I'd better put on the O that my great-grandfather dropped uh, 100 years ago. So then you dropped it again. You started yeah. with Dowd, went right. to O'Dowd, and... Went back. And right. did you sign very many paintings uh, with O'Dowd? Yeah, I did. did you? Yeah, there were some, yeah. Well, talking about pop culture, and not, not pop culture so much, but popular objects mm -hmm. that you were painting, and you started painting uh, the postage stamp, which, which we have here, and you said was... Um, painted in the 60s. They're not painted per se, um, a, a direct replica. You kind of... Uh, no, that was never my intention to reproduce uh, the subject exactly. Um, my involvement with it is from the view that they're, they're symbols. And uh, unlike a lot of the East Coast counterparts who did that, I think not only myself, but many of the West Coast painters tended to approach the, the object with a little more, uh, the hand of the artist more evident. Good. She wants the way you distorted things were mm -hmm. changing the, the lettering or the words? Changing the words, dropping letters, uh, changing coloration. Uh, certain kind of paint handling. What kind of paint were you using at the time? Uh, the first the earlier paintings were in oil and later on uh, around 63, 64 I began using acrylics. Were, were, is this really a, post, a replica of a postage stamp? This upside yes, down? Yes it is, right. Probably it's the most valuable stamp there is in the world. One, one of those is I think for a stamp collector is somewhere around a quarter of a million, three hundred thousand dollars. Did you There's actually see the stamp? No, or were you no. working from it? Or? Reproductions in stamp collector's books. Oh, so that's how, yeah, you, sure. how that came to be. You know, we talked about the East Coast doing things and the mm -hmm. West Coast doing things. How do you think that phenomenon came about, that all of that these people were thinking in the same kind of terms? I don't know. It's, uh, a lot's been written about it. and. Uh, it's just one of those phenomena that begins to occur. I think in looking back uh, and seeing some of the bios of a lot of the artists, we were all born within a year or two of each other, all, uh, except I think Roy, who's somewhat older. But here on the West Coast, Joe Good, Ed Roche, myself, and there's only a year or two, so there was something about that generation, that kind of uh, post-war uh, most of the people I went to school with were Korean veterans. So you so, think that was like yeah, there was simplifying a, there was a period, you know, it was kind of this beginning and then what happened in the 60s with the, the whole movement kind of breaking free of uh, what had gone before, not only in art but socially. And, then, uh, and, and when you got to the late 60s, is that when you started with the, uh, the currency paintings? No, no, those, uh, the first currency painting was done in, in 61. And what, oh, it was, so it was as, as mm -hmm. early as the stamps. You were doing them uh, concurrently? The stamp was done, in, the first stamp was in San Francisco in 60. Oh. And then uh, the currency, I moved to L.A. in 61. You have a, you brought a currency painting with you, just mm -hmm. so we can compare it to the um well, this is... Uh, currency didn't have to just be a $1 bill or a $5. You did no. coins as well, didn't you? Coins and uh, occasionally and, and folded them, cropped them, tore them, uh, approached the, the whole concept from a lot of different uh, angles. And what is this painting called? Uh, it's a dr actually a, a construction. It's construction. Uh, it's corrugated. Uh, it's a combination of graphite and, and acrylic wash, uh, along with a certain kind of a construction element. And uh, play money is stuffed in the, where the, the swings open. And it has this, I call them banks. And this is, it says deposit here. Right. Of course, that's not on a dollar bill. But no. some of them, you've, you've taken the ones out or um, left this space empty. Mm -hmm. Just 
or change the wording. Right. What what happened when you started painting uh, the currency? Because I think a, a really kind of it was seems strange to me. You were painting on corrugated paper, or you're painting on canvas that's maybe sometimes six feet mm -hmm. long and five feet yeah, large, wide. Large paintings. Large right. paintings. What happened with um, the, was it the FBI? No, it was actually the Secret Service came <laughs> uh, to my studio door one morning and said, uh, you have to come downtown with us uh, because you're counterfeiting. So my wife and I went down to the federal building in Los Angeles. Counterfeiting on these right. huge you know, things? I had, uh, you know, I committed a crime by painting these large paintings of bills. And they were very serious. And we spent the entire day down there, and they kind of tried to intimidate me and say all these things about the law and brought out the letter of the law and read it to me. And <laughs> I didn't take them seriously, but they were very serious. And then they said they were going to confiscate all the work at museums. And, and then how it. did it clear up? Well, they did keep some work. I have a receipt for contraband. Uh, <laughs> they had some drawings they kept. Told me not to paint money anymore and uh, let me go home. But, but did you continue oh, to paint sure, money? Oh, sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that came out of it that was a great thumbprint painting mm -hmm. that you did. Um, yeah, I, my reaction to all of that was uh, later on, the day or two after, uh, was some sense of outrage. And I think uh, the thumbprint became symbolic of that, that kind of... Well, we have to, to leave right now. And I, I think the idea that... Uh, you got busted for paying <laughs> money. <laughs> it's very good. If you were going to talk about um, the, the crossover with objects to what's happening today or what you're mm -hmm. painting today, what would they be? Well, I, I haven't never abandoned the object. Uh, it's always been very much a part of my work. Uh, and what I, the work I'm doing now is an outgrowth of what the 70s the work I did in the 70s. See, that's the, these. Right, and this is, deals with some of the parallels between modern physics and Eastern mysticism. And uh, some of the inspiration for the work came from a book called The Tao of Physics. And I deal with the energy, looking at objects from the inside out. So we're going to look for you and okay. in the future and from the inside out. <laughs> and don't go away, we'll be right back with someone else who is as interesting as Robert Dowd and who wants to talk as much as he does. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and we're back. Robert Dowd left his paintings on the set, so you'll get to see them when we interview Katie Wagner. Katie Wagner grew up in Hollywood. She was in the total Hollywood environment. Her father is Robert Wagner, her stepmother's actress Jill St. John, and the late Natalie Wood. Her little sister Natasha Gregson uh, Wagner is lighting up the screen, and she is acting in so many movies now. Little wonder that Katie is an entertainment reporter. Did I leave any of your family out, Katie? <laughs> yeah, well, since we're talking about my family, Joan, um, my mom you left out, who was an actress, Marion Marshall. She was in the old Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis movies. And my two older brothers, one's a special effects guy, and one was a studio executive and a producer, and then the little one, Courtney Wagner, who we're not sure what she's going to do yet. But. I don't think she has a chance, <laughs> does she? Uh, did you ever think of acting? Um, you know, other people think of it more for me than I think of it. I'm really not into it. I'm not into it now more than ever because I have a relationship with the camera. I toy with the idea, and I'm going to do a little studying just in case. Because I get calls a lot. Do you want to come in and audition? And I'm afraid. You know, so we'll see. I don't, I don't really want to do it, though. How did you break into TV reporting? I really kind of fell into it. I was being interviewed. My dad and I were being interviewed together about each other. And I was kind of lost and looking for what to do. And um, Someone called me and said, listen, we'll give you an opportunity to do this. I was sitting with an interviewer like I'm sitting with yourself. <laughs> and I thought, I could do that. And uh, someone called me and gave me a great opportunity, and it ended up happening. And I got an ABC special, and it went from there. Did, did the idea of being Robert Wagner's daughter play into it? Did, they, did, did you ever think that you could do the big interview with, with your father, and that would put you over the edge? Um, I don't think so. You know. Uh, 
No, I mean, I, I have, my dad has helped me. I don't want to say I've used my dad a lot, but he's definitely been my, my model a lot for me and helped me a lot. He's, I've interviewed him many times. But, of course, I know everything about him, so it's not exactly like the, the interview to get. But, but it, uh, it, it would be the interview for you where other people couldn't get it, maybe. Or maybe something happened in your family with all these Hollywood people, and it was something that you wanted to break to the press. You wanted to be the first one there. Did it, has anything like that ever happened? Not really. I really separate the two. I, I um, you know, sometimes I think it might hurt me because I'm not the kind of journalist that wants to break news. I rather tell it the healthy way and once it's public, personally. And let's face it, there's a million other people out there breaking the news, so it's too much of a race. I think that's really uh, a very, as you say, healthy way to look at it. I always think that people say what we're doing is kind of fluff and yet that's what people want to see they want to talk about yeah. fluff I mean I just I really want I personally want to stay healthy and show the, the healthier side of Hollywood and, and the crazy side too but you know people all over the country must think we are absolute freaks here with the way the tabloids are and the way television is now and so but but you actually started um, I don't want to say from the bottom up, but I know you started uh, at Rogers and Cowan, or were you doing something in show business before that as I well? No, I really wasn't. I mean, I for a second thought I could maybe, this is embarrassing to say, but <laughs> model when I was young. <laughs> I was lost in a fog, you know, and I... Well, I, I remember. <laughs> you know, and I thought, oh, I, I think it was because my mom's neighbor was one of the biggest models of the 70s, John McMurray, and I thought, oh, well, I can try a model, you know, he'll help me. And, it was a disaster. I just brought home a few good pictures from my dad and traveled the world. It was great. But um, I fell into it at Rogers and Cowan, and it was great. It ended up being something for me that I really loved, and it's been invaluable for what I do now. And I really did start, I mean, my dad's name definitely helped me get my foot in the door. It helps no matter what. But once you get your foot in, if you don't perform, they'll kick you out as fast as you got in. Exactly. And at Rogers and Cowan, that uh, is one of the top public relations firms. I imagine when you say it was invaluable, you learned from yeah. the beginning up. Well, you learn about celebrities' mood swings and how to, you know, how to uh, have the couth and, and uh, behavior to be around them. And you learn what's important and what's not, and, and a lot of etiquette that I needed to learn to be in the entertainment business. Did you also learn to write? Do they teach you I how to write? I learned to write things? a little bit. I didn't, I'm learning more now as I've been pushed out on my own and have to write more things. Um, but I didn't learn to write too much then, but I'm learning now. Which takes me to <laughs> your first uh, gig, I guess, was movie time. Yeah. Is that what you did? It's now E! Entertainment? Yeah, it was a real small, friendly cable channel, kind of like this one. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it. It was so great. I really got to feel out the field of entertainment journalism and see what I was best at and see. And I was actually very lucky then because I didn't have to go out to premieres and all of that, which I do have to do now. Did so. you write? At, at that time? No. Were you writing at that no. time? I had a writer that really was me. He put the words in my mouth. We worked together, but I mean, he was, I became him and he became me. So what were you doing? Just um, news reporting? I was doing hosting, news reporting, one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, live interviews. And then I went to MTV after that, which was really a cush job. I mean, millions of people are seeing you all <laughs> over the country. And uh, it was kind of strange, too, because I wasn't hardly doing anything. I'd show up, do a few few hours of work, and then I was all over the place. But were you writing then, or was someone still writing still for Still writing you? for me. It wasn't until recently, until about the last job that I've had, that I've had to write. When you, when you were at MTV, and you were obviously um, standing in the line with all the paparazzi, as they do, and sticking the mic in front of people's uh, faces. Was someone, was there, did you have something in your ear and the person was saying, this is uh, Burt Reynolds, no. ask him about no. something? I, if that happened to me, Joan, I would be going, I know who it is, <laughs> stop it, you know? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I think once I had an IFB mic, I get a live Oscar show or something, but after, I realized that I just, I couldn't even handle that. <laughs> so you don't use that at all? I don't use that, unless it's live television, really, really live, but, and, and in, the, in the case of the show that I've been doing recently, which was, um, which I'll tell you about, uh, I really was out there in the field a lot. And I did have someone behind me like, oh, ask him this, ask him that. But I don't listen. I don't listen do you, to what you they don't say. Need you know. you don't I, feel I do need it, but if I didn't have it, I'd miss it. But when I have it, I want to go, know. shut up, shut <laughs> up, get away, you know? <laughs> did you have to train for this job? Was there any training involved? I keep asking you about the writing aspect, I guess, because I'm a journalist at heart. But did you have to train voice training or? I worked on my voice a little because I have voice problems. You know, I don't have that real American. Uh, you know, good voice. I, I have like this scruffy on the edge, rough voice. So 
Uh, I've worked on my voice a little bit. And I, you do that with a teacher? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, it costs lots of money an hour. <laughs> it's a great field to get into. <laughs> and then does it help you? Do you really feel like yeah, it's Yeah, it teaches you about awareness and about breathing and about, yeah, about vocalizing. I mean, you know, you know when you meet somebody and they really they kind of talk like this, uh -huh. it really ruins them. So, so she gives you... you be there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and with the writing thing, you know, it's interesting that you keep saying it because so many psychics have said to me, so many, I've been to about three, and they all say to me, you're going to be a writer and you should be writing and you are writing. And so I think But they must feel this in you because I think part of even TV reporting, in your mind, you're writing the story mm -hmm. as you're going along. I think you're just blocking it out. Mm -hmm. You just uh, finished a contract with Worldwide Entertainment news. Isn't that an impressive thing? Yes. Worldwide entertainment news. What was it? Um, it's this great company that came together with a British company to do entertainment stories and sell them all over the world. And I had a show that was been running for the last year and a half on the ITV network in London called Hollywood Report. And then we were in like 21 other markets. I mean, Korea and all how, over. How the long place. was your show? It was like over a year and a half. No, how now. long in duration? Oh, half an hour. Half oh, an it hour. was. It's a half an hour weekly show. A Scottish guy hosted it, and um, I was the Hollywood Reporter, and it's called Hollywood Report. And I really got to feel out again the field here, and I really am like thankful that I get to pay my dues now and stand out there and scream for celebrities and all that, and really learn how to do the stuff. So Is I'm, that what you did, or did you do in studio? I did a little bit of everything except in studio. Uh, what are we going to see? You brought us a clip to I see Katie Wagner at work. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just show you a little bit of how the show went that I've been doing. So it's a little bit of everything. We'll take a look. It's called Hollywood Report. Okay. On our first ever show, I interviewed David Hasselhoff, the star of Baywatch. And we thought it was about time that we got a little update from him. So we tracked him down on location in Santa Monica where they're shooting brand new episodes for the new season of Baywatch. Well, that irresistible mix of beaches, bathes, sun, sea, sex, and sand comes to your screens once more this winter. Baywatch star David Hasselhoff is out there filming more episodes for next year. But there have been some cast and crew changes. Where did you get a makeup woman like this? What? Well, she comes uh, very cheap. It's my daughter, you know. She comes to the set with me occasionally, and she just loves to do makeup. Was that a hard interview to do with David Hasselhoff? <laughs> no, that was one of the easier ones. He's, you know, he's so professional and so nice. And um, he helped me out and came on the first show, and so we went back to catch up with him down there at the beach while they were shooting. The show was huge in England. Baywatch is... Oh, so that was a good oh, thing for you to do. Yeah. What about Dutch TV? You said you were doing work with Dutch TV now. Yeah, um, I'm just doing some freelance work for this, for this show that's on in Holland, a big show called Showtime. And it was funny, I was out in the field the other night at an Emmy party. Someone said, so who are you working for now? And I said, Dutch television. And people keep saying to me, God, you really get around. I you know. know. Well, it <laughs> sounds like, do you have an agent? Yeah, I have an agent. I'm managers. It's just like being an actress. It's just you're not, you know. <laughs> but it's this big international connection, right? Yeah. Um, if you had a chance to have your own show, would you want to have your own show? Sure. What, what, what kind of show would you want to have? I just saw Ricky Lake's new show where it's like another stand-up Oprah. Right. I mean, what would you want to do? I probably wouldn't want to do that, although I don't want to say what I wouldn't want to do because I'd really do anything. But I think that I'm not best with um, people off the street, you know, that... that I'm just not as good with them because I think it makes me seem aloof, which I'm not, but it just tends to appear that way. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to do what Arsenio does. I'd like to do what you do. I love what Bob Costas does. I love this kind of setup, you know. Do you think that um, this kind of show is dying? Just an interview show? No, it seems to be, <laughs> you know, the only reason it's dying is because there's so many, so they don't have as long a life. But. Uh, no, I think you can't get enough of them. What about um, patterning yourself before we leave? What reporter, male or female or um, talk show host, would you want to pattern yourself after? Um, I'd say there's a few. I love Lisa Gibbons. I think she's great. Um, I love Maria Shriver. I really like, Bar I mean, I love Barbara Walters. How can you not, you know, but no one can be like Barbara Walters. <laughs> but do you have, do you kind of look at them and say, the next time you do an interview, I'm going to,
keep something in mind and try to do it? I take a little bit from everybody, but the do key you? is listening. You know, I take a little bit from everybody. I mean, not everybody, because I don't like, you know... But the ones you talked about? Yeah. Yeah. And I love Bob Costas' interview, Late Night. I think he's great when I'm awake. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think you brought a lot to us, and we're going to watch the tape next, and we're going to see how much we can take from what you did and how much we can learn from you. Katie Wagner, thanks for being Thank with you. us today. And thanks to all of you for watching our show today.